Starting off this countdown, we have the Alice Killings. I've talked about this creepypasta before, but basically it's a famous Japanese urban legend about a mysterious serial slayer. They would go around murdering random individuals. At the scene of their gruesome crime, they would leave a single playing card by the body with the name Alice written on it in the victim's blood. The killer ended up taking the lives of five individuals. Well, in 2003, there was a serial killer in Spain that would also leave playing cards by their victim just like the Alice Killer. He ended up slaying six individuals before the police caught him. Coming in at number nine, we have the Facebook messages. So the creepypasta I'm gonna be talking about is the one titled, My Dead Girlfriend Keeps Messaging Me on Facebook. And it's pretty self-explanatory what happens. A guy's girlfriend passes away but keeps messaging him on Facebook saying random things, almost as if she's like toying with him from the dead. Well, in 2016, Kayla Brown and her boyfriend Charlie Carver were kidnapped by a serial killer. Charlie was killed, but Kayla was kept alive in a shipping container for two months. To avoid suspicion, the killer went on both of their Facebooks and sent messages and status updates to not worry friends and family. He said that they were fine and left on their own, but eventually he was caught and Kayla was rescued. Moving on to number eight, we have the Axeman of New Orleans. Legend goes that in the early 20th century, French photographer and inventor Edouard Martel was traveling the United States taking thousands of photos of the places he visited. He typically would hide his camera and set it to go off automatically. That way he could capture real life without people knowing. However, after reviewing his photos, he realized that he captured a brutal serial killer who police could never catch. He was named the Axeman of New Orleans or New Orleans. You guys make fun of how I say that name. Now parts to this story are true. Arts are false. For starters, Edward Alfred Martel is a real person, but he wasn't a photographer. Second, the Axeman of New Orleans was a real killer. During an 18 month spree from 1918 to 1919, he killed six individuals. So this creepypasta was based off of a real killer. In our seventh spot, we have the Green Man. Now there are a bunch of different versions to the story, but they are all about a green man with no face that stalks the streets of Pennsylvania at night. Some say he was splashed with acid, Others say he was struck by lightning. Whatever happened to him, it turned his skin green and melted his face. They called him Charlie No Face or the Green Man. As scary as it sounds, this story is completely true, but it's a really sad one. So Charlie No Face was indeed a real person. His name was Raymond Robinson. When he was a child, he was badly injured by an electrical accident that caused his face to appear disfigured. As a result, he was fearful of going out during the day, so at night, that's when he would go out and he would go for walks. He was completely harmless, but people who encountered him would be immediately frightened by his appearance. Making our way down the list at number six, we have Capgraw Delusion. The creepypasta Capgraw Delusion is about a woman named Harriet Starling Malcolm. She ends up developing Capgraw Delusion as a result of a brain aneurysm and starts to believe her younger brother is an imposter. He's been replaced by someone that looks like him, but it isn't him. When Harriet passes away, Way, her husband develops this disorder as well and ends up killing the brother. Capgraw delusion is a real psychological condition. Those that suffer from it believe that people around them have been replaced by exact copies. Those with dementia or schizophrenia may also suffer from this delusion. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with Barbie AVI. Barbie AVI is a pretty famous urban legend. It surrounds someone finding a mysterious video titled Barbie AVI. The video is very very fuzzy and the sound is distorted, but it features a blonde woman getting interviewed. In the urban legend, the narrator recognizes where the video was filmed and ends up going to the place. They end up in an old abandoned building where they hear weird moans and whimpers coming from a room. They flee in a panic. Now, the backstory to this video is not real but the creepy video itself certainly is. Over the years, a lot of people tried to figure out what the video was about. At one point in the video, the girl raises her arm and it's revealed that it's completely amputated. Some people think that the video was about BIID, Body Integrity Identity Disorder, and that the woman cut off her arm because she didn't find it to be beautiful. Eventually, it was revealed that her name is Tammy. When she was younger, she was washing clothes with an old school washing machine with no safety features. While the 
machine was operating, she stuck her arm in to push a sheet in more, and it ended up trapping her arm and twisting it until it ripped off. The video we see is when she's older and is trying to get a job at a modeling company, and it's her interview. In our fourth spot, we have the Russian sleep experiment, another very famous creepy pasta, and boy is it creepy all right. The creepy pasta is quite a lengthy read, but basically, story goes that in the 1940s, Russian researchers were conducting unethical tests on enemy prisoners. They captured five enemies that they planned to keep awake for 30 days using a gas based stimulant. They wanted to see the effects that sleep deprivation had on the brain. And in the end, everything goes wrong. They spiral into madness and then they all die in gruesome ways. Now, I hope this exact story isn't true, but it's quite possible that it was based on the number of real world examples of governments experimenting on humans. Like Project MK Ultra, where CIA agents were injecting people with LSD. Or Project Sleepless Soldiers, where Soviet soldiers were given a drug that let them fight for days without needing sleep. Moving on to number three, we have Laughing Jack. Laughing Jack is a legend about a clown type creature that likes to befriend children and then get them to commit dark deeds, or he even will harm them. He usually slices them open and replaces their organs with candy. Well, in 2015, a 12 year old girl stabbed and killed her stepmom after Laughing Jack told her to do so. The girl claimed that she heard voices months before the stabbing occurred. She even begged her father for help, but Laughing Jack got to her. These creepypastas may not be real, but this just shows how real their influence is. Coming in at number two, we have Slender Man. This dude went from being a Photoshop photo to a creepypasta and then a film star. His influence is huge, and I'm sure all of you know all about Mr. Slendy. Clearly, his fake but his influence is so real. In 2014, an Ohio woman was stabbed several times by her 13 year old daughter, who claimed that Slender Man told her to do it. The woman claimed that she came home one night from work to her daughter standing in the kitchen, wearing a white mask. She had her hood up and her hands were covered by her sleeves. She then was attacked by her own daughter. She had cuts on her neck and face and was stabbed in the back, all because of Slender Man. And in her number one, spot we have Walking Sam. Walking Sam is said to be a shadow demon that convinces people to commit suicide. It's said to live in the woods at the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota. It appears as a thin tall creature wearing a black top hat. It wears the soles of its victims dangling down from its arms. Here's the thing. In 2015, there was a huge amount of suicides in the area where Walking Sam is said to live. From 2014 to 2015, there was 103 suicides. Some say the number could be higher. One local said that there was more than 200 suicides in only three months. That's incredibly freaky. Maybe Walking Sam is real. Starting off this countdown, we have the year was 1991. This is a creepy pasta about someone witnessing Michael Dunahy get abducted from a place. Playground. Some man rolled up in a bear costume and lured him in with promises of candy and games. It ends with the narrator apologizing, wishing he could have done more for Michael. And guess what? This is based off of a true story. On March 24th, 1991, Michael Donahue went missing from a playground at his school. To this day, he still hasn't been found. What's even creepier is that the author of this creepy pasta went by the name, I'm sorry, Michael. So it makes us wonder if this person actually did witness Michael's kidnapping tried to help him and then failed. Maybe this was his way of releasing some of the guilt that's been building up inside of him. Before I go any further, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up because it really helps us out. Moving on to number nine, we have Cry Baby Lane. Cry Baby Lane is a creepy pasta about a very disturbed man that used to work at Nickelodeon Studios. His name was Peter Lawyer. He was a director over there. The only problem is that all the ideas he pitched were always very dark and disturbing. That's when the movie Cry Baby Lane comes into play. For this movie, Peter wanted it about Siamese twins that were so starved that they resorted to eating each other. They clawed at each other's eyes until one of them passed away. While pitching this idea, he started showing images for inspiration, like images of real people with their limbs hacked off. In the end, he created this film called Cry Baby Lane, and parents were outraged at how disturbing it was when it was meant to be for kids. Well, guess what? 
Crybaby Lane is a real Nickelodeon film. It was released in 2000, but was quickly pulled from air and never seen again. This was because the film was too controversial and too dark to be a kids movie. It's now considered a real lost film. Moving on to number 8, we have Jeff the Killer. According to multiple articles, the story of Jeff the Killer is based off of a true story. So first, who is Jeff the Killer? Basically, Jeff was a young boy whose face was burnt off with acid and then was set on fire. His face became extremely terrifying looking, but he actually loved his new appearance. He also tried burning out his own eyelids and then he carved a smile up his cheeks. He will then hide in your closet and when you go to sleep, he will kill you. Apparently, Jeff was based off a real boy who got set on fire and it left his face extremely disfigured. Not only that, but you know the image that they use as Jeff? Turns out that that is a Photoshop photo of a girl named Katie Robinson. In 2008, Katie posted her picture on 4chan and people immediately began making fun of her weight. And that's when people began to edit this photo. Later, it was revealed that Katie took her own life from all the hate and bullying she received. Knowing all of this just makes the story of Jeff the killer that much more disturbing. In our seventh spot, we have the watcher. I mean, there are tons of creepy pastas out there when somebody feels like somebody's watching them. Then maybe they get a message like, aren't you glad you didn't turn on the light? Or why do you look so afraid? Blah, blah, you get it. Well, there are a number of real life stories out there about this exact thing happening in real life. One night, a 16 year old girl in England got a text from a random number. It said, I'm watching you. The number told her that he was going to hang himself from her bedroom window and that he was in her house. That night, she was so freaked out that she slept in her mom's room. And it's a good thing that she did. The next morning, she went back to her room and found the guy who had been texting her asleep under her bed. That is absolutely horrifying. I am always locking my doors from now on and I'm gonna install like a whole high tech security system too. Like damn, that's terrifying. Moving on to number six, we have the Pope Lick Monster. So this is a weird cryptid slash creepypasta slash urban legend. The Pope Lick Monster is a creature that is a mix of a human and a goat. It then lives on top of a railway bridge in Kentucky. If you go there alone at night, then the monster will hypnotize you and will lead you to him. He will then convince you to stand on top of the bridge where a train passes and we'll wait until you get hit by that train. Well, guess what? This monster has been blamed for a number of real life deaths, some of which were people who were out looking for this monster and then got hit by the train by accident. The number of deaths in the area actually got so high that they now imposed a law that you can't go there and you could be prosecuted for trespassing. We're now at our fifth and halfway mark with the well to hell. Legend goes that Russian geologists were drilling a well searching for oil or natural gas when all of a sudden they felt a blast of heat shoot out from the well. From there, they heard these weird noises. It sounded as if someone was screaming for help. Another version of this creepypasta claims that 13 workers died after the devil crawled out of the hole and then dragged them down with him to to hell. Well, guess what? This is a real well. Geologists in Russia have created a super deep borehole. The hole goes 40,000 feet down to the Earth's crust. And guess what? They have heard strange noises coming out of it. Nothing like screams, but still, they've heard some weird, unexplainable sounds that have startled them. Coming in at number four, we have the Bunny Man. The story of the Bunny Man is quite unsettling. And no, it's not about the Easter Bunny. Basically, the story revolves around a patient of a mental asylum who one day managed to escape. He would then gut bunnies and hang them from a bridge underpass, giving him the name The Bunny Man. Things got worse when he started to target humans. Well, guess what? The Bunny Man is somewhat real. In October of 1970, people reported seeing this bunny man around town. It was a man dressed up in a bunny costume that would chase people and throw a hatchet at them. This happened to one couple who had the bunny man throw a hatchet at their car windshield. The next sighting was from a security guard who saw this man with a hatchet hacking away at a porch railing. When confronted, he ran away. No one has been able to catch this man. And as creepy as he is, there's no evidence that he has actually murdered anyone. Thankfully, but still, this whole bunny thing doesn't sit right with me. In our third spot, we have the Candyman. The Candyman is an urban legend slash creepy pasta based off the short story by Clive Barker, and then they have the whole movie adaptation of it. Legend goes that if you look in the mirror and chant his name five times, then he will appear. Then he'll come out of the cabinet 
and then murder you. In 1987, the Candyman came to life. A woman named Ruth McCoy was killed after two men climbed through her medicine cabinet and then shot her. These men used the same method of killing that the Candyman would use. They broke through the connecting wall of Ruth's apartment and entered her home through her cabinet. That is absolutely horrifying. Moving on to number two, we have Laughing Jack. Laughing Jack is a clown type creature with long arms and a creepy big smile, which is always plastered on his face. Always. Jack's goal is to befriend children and then fool them into trusting him. Well, in 2015, a girl stabbed her stepmother to death and then set her whole house on fire. Well, guess what? When interviewed, she claimed that Laughing Jack told her to do it. In the end, I think the girl was diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder and she claimed that she would hear voices in her head. And in our number one spot, we have Slender Man. I'm sure you all know the story of Slender Man by now. The 15 foot tall creature that is always seen wearing a classy form fitting tux, which must be custom made because it fits his tall lanky body so well. <laughs> Slender Man is known to primarily prey on young people. In 2014, a girl stabbed her mother multiple times. Apparently, she did this out of orders from Slender Man. Thankfully, the mom survived. But the mom said that she came home one night and her daughter was just waiting for her in the kitchen wearing a white mask and holding a knife. I swear, this is the reason why I'm never having kids. Joking. Maybe, who knows, but kids are pretty whack nowadays. Going off at number 10 now, we have the Alice Killings. I'm sure many of you Creepypasta fans will have heard of this one. Story goes that for six years, from 1999 to 2005, five killings took place in Japan. Not just random killings either. Strange, unsolved, and very connected killings. At each murder scene, a calling card was left by the killer. The calling card was quite literally a card. It was a playing card. The cards always vary, but one thing remained the same. The name Alice was written on each one in blood. Each of the murders were as gruesome and as strange as the next, and despite multiple arrests, the real killer was never caught. That's how the story goes though, although there is not much evidence for it being anything other than a creepypasta. There is, however, a real story that is eerily similar. Alfredo Galán Sotillo was a Spanish serial killer who killed six people in 2003. When attempting his third murder, his victim survived and another was able to escape. Sotillo left a Three of Cups card at the scene. Now, when the media picked up on this, he began to leave playing cards at the murder scenes of his next victims until he eventually surrendered to police. He was sentenced to 142 years and three months in prison. Next up at number nine now, we have the Russian sleep experiment. This very famous creepypasta tells a story of five test subjects who were given a sleep inhibiting stimulant in a Soviet experiment. Day by day, with no sleep at all, they began to descend into madness. They eventually sealed themselves inside their chamber and covered the windows with feces and torn book pages so the scientists couldn't watch them. The story continues and contains mutilation, blood, violence, and murder in that order, actually. It's not for the faint-hearted, but did it actually happen? Well, not as far as we can tell. Many people do think the creepypasta was inspired, though, by real experiments conducted by governments. The British military testing LSD on its soldiers, Americans testing mustard gas on their own soldiers, and Japan's Unit 731, which tortured an estimated 12,000 prisoners of war during World War II. Perhaps one of the unknown experiments involves stopping people from sleeping. Moving on to number eight now, we have the Capgrass Delusion. That's the name of this creepypasta that appeared online in January 2017. It told the tale of a woman called Harriet who had an aneurysm that severely damaged her brain. After that, she began to believe that one by one, everyone in her life had been replaced by an imposter. At first, she began to believe her younger brother had been replaced, then her own son. She told her husband that he was an imposter. When she died in surgery, her husband then took on this delusion as well and eventually attacked their son with a knife. Well, if that sounds like a terrifying story, it's based on a real condition. Capgrass delusion is a genuine psychiatric disorder in which a person holds a delusion that a friend, spouse, parents, or other close family member has been replaced by an identical imposter. It's a scary condition that can leave a person becoming extremely paranoid and isolated. Perhaps the most scary part though is how poorly understood the condition is. There isn't even a definitive way to diagnose it. There is very little research on how to treat it and of course no known cure at the time of recording this video. Next up at number seven now we have Abandoned by Disney. This is an infamous creepypasta put forward by Reddit user SlimeBeast. Now he claimed that many years ago Disney built a 30 million dollar park named Mowgli's 
palace. It was supposed to recreate many locations from the Jungle Book, a lush tropical paradise filled with exotic flora and fauna. Just before the park opened though, everything was mysteriously shut down. He went to go and investigate the abandoned site. He reported discovering terrifying Disney character costumes that came to life in the most scary way imaginable. The details are too gruesome to go into here. While the story has been dismissed as a hoax or a creepypasta, there may be some inspiration taken from real life. Disney does have a number of abandoned parks, most famously Treasure Island which was closed in 1999. It has been visited by a number of urban explorers who have taken a lot of creepy pictures, but none of some animated scary suits yet. Moving on to number 6 now we have Polybius. In 1981 a story started in Portland and slowly crept across America, then the world and then entered internet legend forever. Most of us are probably too young to remember arcade halls with rows of arcade games being played by crowds of kids. Before the rise of home consoles though, these were the places to be. In Portland, kids started talking about one particular arcade game, Polybius. Rumour had it that Polybius was insanely addictive. Whenever kids were finally forced off it by the next in line, they reported feeling nauseous and stressed. Some even had seizures. People started noticing that the game was being serviced a lot more than the others. Once a month, men in black suits would come and copy the machine's hard drive but leave all of the money. This led people to believe that Polybius was part of an experimental CIA mind control program. Some people still believe this to be true, but others see it as just an interesting creepypasta. Now if that's the case, it may be based on some real stories. In 1981, in Portland, a kid really did get sick during an arcade marathon. A few days later, federal agents really did seize a bunch of arcade cabinets as part of a gambling bust. Or they were CIA, whatever you want to believe. Coming at number 5 now we have Robert the Doll. I'm sure you guys have all read creepypastas about dolls that come to life and kill their owners. They're extremely popular, there isn't even one that I can particularly single out though. What I can say is that a lot of them are probably based on the true story of Robert the Doll. He's a very real doll that was owned by Robert Otto in Florida in 1904. The doll was named after Robert. Now according to legend the doll had supernatural abilities that allowed it to move, change its facial expression expressions and even make giggling sounds. People said it was a voodoo figurine that was totally aware of its own surroundings. Over the years this doll was passed on to other people and it's said to have caused everything from car accidents to broken bones, job losses, divorces and all kinds of misfortune really. You can actually go and see Robert in real life in the East Martello Museum in Florida. If you dare, I don't. Next up, number four now, we have The Well to Hell. For a while now, a creepypasta has been going around about The Well to Hell, a hole that was drilled so deep it reached hell itself. That's not even the scary part though. According to the story, the scientists who drilled this hole also recorded a terrifying sound emitting from the bottom the sound of all the souls in hell screaming out in horror. Here's a little clip for you guys. You have been warned. <laughs> Now they say that the hole was drilled in 1989 in Siberia and that after the scientists heard that sound they fled and never returned again. The inspiration for this creepypasta may have come from real holes that were bored. One such example is the Kola Superdeep Borehole. It's in Russia, it was drilled as a scientific experiment and it's the deepest artificial hole ever drilled, reaching the depth of 12,262 meters or about 40,230 feet. Now just to put that in perspective, most airlines fly about 35,000 feet. This hole is deeper than the height at which planes fly. Think about that for a second. That site was abandoned in 1995 with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, although I've seen no evidence of screaming souls from hell yet again. Moving on to number 3 now, we have the Slender Man stabbings. In May 2014, the small town of Waukesha, Wisconsin was shaken by the stabbing of a 12 year old girl there. The brutal attack was said to be inspired by the popular Slender Man creepypasta. 12 year olds Anissa Weir and Morgan Geeser have become obsessed with Slender Man ever since the discovering him on the creepypasta wiki. They began to believe that Slenderman was real and that he wanted them to prove their loyalty to him. By doing this, they could become his proxies and do his bidding. They could also prove his existence and prevent their own families from being harmed by him. This delusion led them to believe that they needed to kill someone to show their loyalty. Their intended victim was Peyton Lutner. They lured their classmate out into the woods and stabbed her 19 times, leaving her for dead. Now, Amazingly, Lutner managed to drag herself to a nearby road where she 
she was found by a cyclist. She recovered after six days in hospital. The attackers were sentenced to very long periods in mental health institutions. Moving on to number two now, we have Lavender Town Syndrome. I'm sure many of you guys have heard me talking about this one before in another video. There have been a number of creepypastas going around over the years about Lavender Town Syndrome. Now, this one is written in the style of a news report claiming that a number of children in Japan killed themselves after hearing the Lavender Town music on the original Pokemon Game Boy games. Apparently, the music for Lavender Town had extremely high frequencies that only children could hear. Some of the children just got headaches and began to feel a bit sick. Others were more seriously affected and ended up jumping from great heights. Now, this is obviously just a creepypasta, unless there has been a huge cover up. There is no real evidence of kids throwing themselves off heights in Japan because of a Pokemon game. What there is, though, is the story of the original Pokemon anime that may have inspired this story. When the first episode of that aired, 685 children were hospitalized after a scene with flashing lights triggered epileptic seizures in them. Couple this with the high suicide rates in Japan at the time, and it's no surprise that a creepypasta like this was born. And finally, number one now, we have the Green Man. For many years, the people of Brighton Township would swap stories about the Green Man. They said he was a reclusive figure of the night. They said that when he was a boy, he wanted to see into a bird's nest. He climbed on an electric pole, but slipped on his way down and electrocuted himself. The shock should have killed him, but the boy survived, although he lost his eyes, nose, mouth, an ear, and an arm. When he grew up, the disfigured man lived in an abandoned house away from the taunting kids. He became a sort of boogeyman story, but not everyone knows that this is all based on a true story. The real man was Raymond Robinson. He did electrocute himself as a boy and was something of a recluse. What's not true, however, is all the stories of him scaring kids or spooking them. By all accounts, Raymond was a pleasant man who lived with his family and enjoyed long walks walks through Brighton Township. Number 10, which is the creepy text message story. So this creepypasta is actually a website where you can click a button to reveal the next part of a conversation between two friends. The girl is called Annie96 and the guy is called McDavy. It all starts off pretty normal until Annie says she can hear noises coming from outside in the garden. When she looks outside, she sees a man digging in the dirt. Annie tells McDavy to quit messing around in the garden as she knows it's only him, but McDavy swears it's not. But Annie doesn't believe him and next thing she knows, this man is in the house, calling out to her. Annie hides in the closet, frantically texting McDavy as the monster gets closer and closer and closer. But at the last second, the monster disappears, and it seems like a happy ending, with Annie inviting McDavy over the next day. But then McDavy says, Wait, Annie, how do I know this is you? And Annie96 goes offline. Mental. Talk about an emotional roller coaster to kick us off here, guys. We're gonna jump right into number nine now, which is a short but sweet creepy pasta called The Man in the Snow. You are home alone and you hear on the news about the profile of a murderer who is on the loose. You look out the sliding glass doors to your backyard and you notice a man standing in the snow. He fits the profile of the murderer exactly and he is smiling at you. You gulp, picking up the phone to your right and dialing 911. You look back out the glass as you press the phone to your ear and notice he is much closer to you now. You then drop the phone in shock. There are no footprints in the snow. It's his reflection. Whoever said creepypastas had to be long to be scary was lying. Actually, I don't think anyone's ever said that anyway, but let's move right into number eight, which is called The Portraits. It's a tale of a hunter, alone in the woods as nighttime approaches. He tries to find his way out, but gets lost. Instead, stumbling upon a small cabin. He found nobody inside and decided to rest there for the night and explain himself to the owner in the morning. As he looks around the house, he sees the walls are lined with portraits of faces, twisted, ugly, evil faces, and they're all staring at him. He turns his back, faces to the wall, and eventually falls asleep. The next morning, he wakes up, blinking in the sunlight as he rises. He discovers that the cabins had no portraits on the wall, only windows. Ooh, okay, that was a good one, but let's move right into our number seven, which is an email chain called The Candle Cove. It starts off with a bunch of friends reminiscing about a TV show they used to watch as a kid called Candle Cove. They stitch their memories of the show together bit by bit. It was about a girl called Janice who would imagine herself as friends with pirates. Their ship was called the Laughing Stock, and one of their crew was Pirate Percy, who was scared of everything. It all comes flooding back as they piece their memories together, even the villains of the show, who were called Horace Horrible and the Skin Taker, a skeleton that wore a top hat and a cape made out of children's skin. Suddenly, they begin to remember a horrible episode where the puppets were just screaming and screaming and screaming. The camera would cut from character to character as they 
let out a blood curdling scream. Even the girl Janice was moaning and crying like she had been tortured for hours. The email ends with one of the guys saying he went to the nursing home that day to go and see his mother and he asked her, do you remember if I watched a show called Candle Cove? And she said she did. She said, because I used to think it was so strange that you said, I'm going to go watch Candle Cove now, mom. And then you would tune the TV to static and just watch dead air for 30 minutes. You had a big imagination with your little pirate show. Nope, 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 nope. Okay, let's move on to number six, and it's called Never Again. It's the tale of a 17 year old girl with an abusive mother who lets a little girl into her house from a storm outside. The girl is emotionless, unaffected by the cold, and has big black eyes. She says her name is Lacey Morgan. The girl says Lucy can stay, she sets her up with a blanket in her home, but when she wakes up the next day, Lacey is gone. The girl switches on the news and sees that a little girl called Lacey Morgan was killed last night at 7pm, hours before the girl let her into her own home. The news says she was killed by her abusive mother, an abusive mother just like the girl has herself. That night, the girl tries to get a normal night's sleep, but is instead awoken by the touch of Lucy's hand, who whispers, Never again. Ten minutes later, there is a shriek from her abusive mother in the next room. She runs in to find Lucy on top of her, tearing flesh from her chest and throat. Lucy smiles before going for the jugular. The girl faints at the sight of it. Years later, the girl is now free from her abusive mother. She's married and has her own daughter, who she named Lucy. She ends the story with a chilling update from just the other day, when she said she saw a little girl running barefoot through our neighbor's backyard up to their back door. It was around midnight, so I couldn't be sure. But I thought she met my eyes with her black ones, and I could swear she mouthed two words at me. Never again. Okay, we're halfway through our top 10 creepypastas in at number 5 with lightning. The story begins with a man and his son moving into their new home on the night of a huge storm. The little boy is excited by all the lightning and talks about it all the next day. He does it again a few nights later and the night after that. Every morning he wakes up and tells his dad about the lightning, but the father tells him there were no more storms and thinks it's just a reoccurring dream from the first night. Then one morning he's reading the paper and the horror hits him like a truck. There's a story about a sexual predator who had been arrested for taking pictures of little boys through their windows as they slept with flash photography. But it gets worse. The next day the boy runs up to the dad and says, Dad, Dad, there's no more lightning at my window anymore. The dad says, oh, it died down, did it? And the boy replies, no, it's just in my closet. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to go anywhere near that closet. I want to move on to number four, which is called The Girl in a Photograph. One day, a boy was at school when he found a picture on the grass outside of the most beautiful girl he'd ever seen. She had a dress with tights on and red shoes, and her hand was holding up a peace sign. The boy thought she was so beautiful that he decided he had to find her. He asked everyone in the school, and even his own family, but nobody recognised her. Defeated, he went to bed that night with the picture next to his bed, but was awoken by a tapping and giggling from the window. But by the time he got there, it was gone. He had no luck finding answers the next day but was awoken again that night by a tapping and giggling at the window. He followed the sound outside this time, across the road, where BAM! He was hit and killed by a car instantly. The driver jumped up and ran to the boy and found the picture in his hand. He saw a girl wearing a dress with tights on and red shoes and holding up three fingers. Alright guys, we've reached our last few creepy pastas here with number three and it's called The Affair. It tells the story of a man named Jeremy who divorced his wife Gail when he finds out she's been having an affair. All he knows about Gail's new lover is that he's called Chamberlain. As they separate, he notices that Gail has more and more bruises on her each day, but decides to keep his distance as their relationship is already over. Then one day, Gail disappears, no note or text, and Jeremy thinks, well, if I haven't heard from her in 24 hours, I'll let the police know. The next day, he's on his way to work when he gets pulled over by a police car behind him. The officer says he pulled Jeremy over because he noticed his trunk had popped open and asked him to come and look. As they go to the back of the car, they open the trunk to find the lifeless body of Gail in the fetal position. The officer immediately cuffs Jeremy, pins him to the police car, and calls for backup on his radio. He says, this is Officer Chamberlain requesting backup and an ambulance. Oh snap, that was a good one, but let's move right on to our number two, which is simply called The Story. It's a tale of a man who books a room into a hotel with just one condition. Don't look in one room that is out of bounds, it's off limits completely. He agrees and walks to his room, but on the way he sees the forbidden room, and his curiosity gets the better of him. He tried to enter, but the door was locked, so he took a peek through the keyhole. He saw a normal room with a woman in the corner whose skin was completely white. She had her back to the door. Shocked, 
The man went to his room for the night. The next day, he decided to take another look through the keyhole as he passed the forbidden room. But this time, all he saw was red. A deep, thick, unmoving red. He told the woman at the front desk, who didn't look too surprised, she said, you looked through the keyhole, didn't you? And he nodded. She continued, well I might as well tell you the story. A long time ago, a man murdered his wife in that room and her ghost haunts it. But these people were not ordinary. They were white all over, except for their eyes. Their eyes were a deep, deep red. Whoa, okay guys, all right, so far in our creepypasta, we've seen monsters, we've seen murderers, we've seen molesters. But for us, none of them can touch the king of all creepypasta. It's the smiling man in at number one. One day, a guy was walking alone at night when he first noticed him. On the far end of the street was a silhouette of a man dancing. It was a strange dance, similar to a waltz, and he was slowly coming closer. The guy tried to move around him, and as he did, he noticed the man was not only dancing, he was smiling at the sky, his eyes open and wild. By this point, the guy was freaked out and crossed the road, but when he looked back, he saw the smiling man was crouched on the floor behind him. The smiling man rose slowly and continued his dance towards the guy, eyes to the sky and smiling even bigger. The guy confronts him, saying, what do you want? But the smiling man just turned and danced away slowly. The guy walks on before turning to check on the smiling man, but now he was running full speed towards him, and he ran too. He ran as far and as fast as he could all the way home without looking behind him once, but he did end up with possibly the most scary creepypasta of all time. Starting things off in at number 10, we have Prisoner 959. Let me set the scene for you guys. Okay, imagine a very dark, cold prison where all of the worst criminals are locked up behind bars. This prison barely has any rules, the guards are corrupted, and the prisoners would constantly start riots. The cells are even darker, and the feeling of the entire prison would make you think that this place was hell on earth. In the deepest part of the prison, there was one strange cell that nobody had been in except for a few high ranked officials. One day a massive riot broke out and a security guard tried to save his own life. He found the key to the airy cell and he opened it. As he was feeling around, he stumbled upon a large cylinder with a peephole. Once he looked inside, he saw a pair of eyes. One was a discolored white as if he were blind and the other was blood red. The prison guard found a file in the cell that said prisoner 959. In that file, there were pictures of bodies that had been impaled through the mouth and out the coccyx. The bodies were full of blood and they didn't have any skin. The prison guards heard the inmates quickly approaching his cell, so he made a very tough call. He decided to free prisoner 959 in the hopes that he would kill anything and everything in his way so that he can escape. And sure enough, prisoner 959 brutally murdered almost everybody in cold blood, and once the riot was over, he was nowhere to be found, so he could be anywhere lurking in the dark, waiting for his next victim. Boulder City Prison rolls onto this list at number 9. So the sky was full of gloomy clouds and rain began to fall as Dixon Rhodes, the warden of Boulder City Penitentiary, drove towards his prison. As he approached the gates, he noticed that a new guard was stationed at the entrance, but he managed to open up the gate to the prison without any difficulties. The warden made it further into the prison and he noticed the blood splatter on the wall. He turned to another guard and asked him if there was a riot. The guard nodded his head and said yes, but everything is fine now. The guard opened the prison door with the keys and locked it behind the warden. As he made his way through, the room was dark, which was unacceptable, especially after a riot. A guard stepped beside the warden and began to escort him to the office, but suddenly they heard screams of pain and horror beside them. As the warden turned his head, he saw the guard who usually escorts him was locked behind the cell, and those new security guards were actually the prisoners seeking revenge on the warden. Number 8 brings us to the new fish. Technically this one is a reddit no sleep story, but I had to include this in this video. You've all heard the term new fish, right? It's basically what inmates call the new set of prisoners that are coming straight into the penitentiary for the first time. But there was something off with this one new fish. As soon as he stepped into the prison property, the old convicts went wild because he was a good looking kid. The guards thought it would be best to put him in 
protective program because they knew that his life was in danger. But one of the high profile convicts had a lot of connections and called in for a favor. The next day the new fish was transferred into his cell and that's when all hell broke loose. You could hear agonizing screams echoing in the whole prison and some even say that they can hear the sound of flesh being torn and the sound of bones crushing. The next morning the guards inspected the cell and they were actually shocked to discover that the high profile con man was dead. His face was ripped off and all you can see is his organs everywhere and his bones and his skeleton. So somewhere within those prison walls there is a thing that has an insatiable hunger and he definitely should never be messed with. Next up number 7 we have prison numbers. A 27 year old man was sentenced to spend 5 years behind bars at a new prison facility somewhere in the desert. This wasn't your typical prison. The place looked like it was brand new and barely lived in. The cells were massive and some of them could even hold up to 10 or even 25 prisoners. Each prisoner was given a number and they were assigned to certain cell blocks. This one prisoner was given the number 5 from cell block D. Once he was locked up in his cell he began to evaluate his other cellmates. Inmate 6 was friendly but inmate 7 was the complete opposite. He was sketchy and he had some pretty strange habits and inmate 9 was as normal as anyone could be. But one night the sketchy inmate 7 followed number 9 into a dark abandoned corridor and this was during free time. Inmate 6 came running towards the man screaming he's crazy. Inmate 5 was a pretty curious man so he decided to turn the corner to investigate. What he saw was mortifying. Inmate 9 was laying down, there was blood everywhere and sketchy inmate 7 looked up and there was blood on everything. It was on his hands and his mouth. Then it hit him. He now understood why inmate 6 was afraid of 7. And that's because 7, 8, 9. I'm not sure whether this creepypasta was scary or just cringy, but you guys be the judge. I'm, I'm thinking it's cringy. I, I hate that joke. I've been getting letters from the St. Louis prison creepypasta, and this takes us into number 6. A very tall man with broad shoulders knocked on the door and passed the homeowner a letter that was stamped from the St. Louis Correctional Facility. The man thought to himself, I don't know anyone who is from that prison. But he went on to open the letter. On the envelope it said please allow the courier to be present to witness the reading of this letter. As the man began to read it he was thrown off by the horrific details. The person who wrote this said that they are serving a life sentence in prison for brutally murdering his family. He said his mind is being controlled by a demonic and sinister voice that has been telling him to murder them. And then he spit on the judge and tried to kill everyone in the courtroom. The letter talks about how he crushed his two young children's heads and he did it with his bare hands and how he strangled his wife to death. On the next day the same courier came again with another letter. This time it was a drawing of a woman who was being tortured. On the third day another letter came from the same courier but this letter was different. The last lines read the demon has grown bored with me being locked up like this. He told me how to end my curse. You make someone else pick up the demon's curse the same old way I did by inviting him into your home home three times. The man reading the letter just froze in shock and he looked up at the courier. His eyes were endless black and he had a cruel grin on his face. The Russian sleep experiment comes in at number 5. Alright guys, prepare yourselves, brace yourselves for this creepypasta slash urban legend because it is pretty graphic and brutal. Let me take you guys back to the 1940s where Russian researchers wanted to conduct an experiment to see what the effects were if you deprived yourself of sleep. Due to ethical reasons, they didn't want to pick any volunteers off the street, so they decided to force five prisoners to participate in this experiment. Yeah, like that's so ethical. The prisons were given an experimental gas that would prevent them from sleeping. Their conversations were recorded and monitored through video cameras and a two-way mirror. For the first few days everything was fine and the prisoners were behaving normally. But on the fifth day, that's when things got really bad. The prisoners became paranoid and started whispering about each other in the microphones. Eventually the prisoners were running around screaming and almost breaking their own vocal cords. On the 15th day, the experimenters decided to put in fresh air instead of the harmful gas, but that actually just made things worse. One prisoner died and the other severely mutilated their bodies. They tore off their flesh, ripped out their abdomen and muscles. When the researchers came to remove them from the room, the prisoners, well, they actually refused and they wanted to be locked up forever. Eventually, all of the prisoners were shot and killed because they wanted to cover up this highly unethical experiment. An empty prison is at number four. At the Pembina prison, there were five floors and it had the capacity to hold 500 inmates. One inmate was sentenced to 
to spend 365 days at this prison. Little did he know he may not make it out alive. Their prisoners would talk to each other quietly between the cells and loudly between each floor. But during one night, the prisoners on the first floor were violently screaming in pain throughout the entire night. As the sun rose, all of the guards were gone and all of the prisoners were locked in their cells without getting any food, water or exercise. So this lasted for several days and as each day passed, another floor of prisoners would start screaming in pain and then stop. On day 364, the only floor that was left standing was the fifth floor. The prisoner had one hellish night left in the prison, but as it turns out, the thing or monster that was eating away at the prison was going to get him. Number three, prison is hell. If you have any form of OCD, then this creepypasta will send chills down your spine. According to the story, a man with a mild form of OCD has been captured for brutally slaying 20 people. He chose to murder 20 people because it, it, it's a nice even number. After his 19th kill, he had an obsessive urge and desire to take someone's last breath. So when his 20th kill came around, he became sloppy. After he brutally attacked a woman on the side of the road with a lead pipe, the police managed to track him down and arrest him. He kept souvenirs from all of his murders so that the prosecutors were able to link him to all 20 murders. The judge wanted to give him the death penalty, but it was illegal in the state where he was. So the judge sentenced him to a thousand and one life sentences because he he knew that giving him an odd number of years was equally as bad as a death penalty, if not worse, because it would linger with him for the rest of his life. Why I am no longer a prison guard comes into number two. A newly graduated student picked up a random job as a corrections officer because the pay was good and they promised flexible hours and also benefits. Even though he had a degree in philosophy, he was desperate for a job. During his first week, he noticed that there was a strange looking inmate that would never socialize and there was just something off about him. When he asked the other guards who the inmate was, they said, oh, that's just Dave, but stay away from him. But curiosity got the best of him. He went to the warden's office to ask about Dave, and the warden even said, do you like having a job? Do you like having a face? then stop asking. Well, that would be enough for me to, you know, leave Dave alone. I don't care who he is anymore. But this young and fuller CEO was desperate to find out some answers. So one day he went to Dave's cell. His cell was actually, it was a little different from the rest. It had concrete walls and a door with a tiny window on it. The guard decided to go inside and Dave stood there grinning and laughing like an evil maniac. Then all of a sudden, the prison guard woke up attached to an IV with the dry blood all over his body. He actually had no idea what happened to him, but he still wakes up in the middle of the night drenched in sweat. His heart is pounding and the feeling that someone is always watching him. So what went on in that cell? Nobody knows. And finally, number one, why was I released from prison, creepypasta? An inmate convicted of committing computer fraud was sentenced to 20 years in a maximum security prison. But within just three months, his sentence was commuted and he didn't need to be placed on parole or probation. Why? Well, at the prison where he was serving his time, there was a legend about an old Nazi inmate named Old Jim who hung himself in his cell. He was notorious for haunting the prison and anyone who looked inside of his dark, dead eyes well, they would be mutilated and viciously murdered in their cell the next day. Of course, he thought these were only rumors until one night. The prisoners heard keys jangling up and down the corridor, but there wasn't a prison guard in sight. Suddenly, you can hear screams of extreme pain and footsteps slowly approaching his cell. The inmate closed his eyes and stayed in a paralyzed state until the morning when the guards were dragging him to solitary confinement. The next day, he pulled into the warden's office and he said, you survived something that has on more than one occasion killed every last inmate on that block. Someone or something decided that you should live. Who am I going to argue with a higher power? So he has been released and sworn to keep that night a secret for as long as he is alive. But he can still hear keys rattling and because of that night, he will never be the same. All right, let's get into it. Starting off number 10 now, we have Jeff the Killer. This is one that somehow I didn't include in the first part. I'm sorry. I don't know how I missed it out looking back at it. I thought I'd start off with it this time to make up for it though. This is the famous story of Jeff, a normal boy living a normal life until the age of 13. His family moved him to a new area against the wishes of he and his brother Liu. They 
They were attacked by bullies and when Jeff fought back he hurt them so badly that the police tried to take him away. The depression and rage he felt after this encounter shows how Jeff went from a normal boy to a twisted psychopath. The next time he met the bullies there were guns, smashed bottles, knives and bleach. Jeff was victorious but now he had a hideous appearance to go with his twisted personality. That was only the beginning though. Jeff carved a Glasgow smile into his own cheeks before butchering his own parents and then turning the knife on his brother. The story is a fairly long read and there's been a lot of spin off stories from it, but it's also become a rite of passage for any creepypasta fans. Next up on number 9 now we have Eyeless Jack. This is Eyeless Jack, a terrifying being with no mouth or nose and eye sockets blacker than the void itself. He makes up for his lack of features though by stealing other people's. Eyeless Jack arrives through your bedroom window in the middle of the night. Black slime oozes from every orifice on his body. And here he gets meticulous. He will cut his victims open but will only ever take one thing. If however the victims begin to rouse, Eyeless Jack becomes enraged and violent. He will hack and slash, mutilating victims to death. The original creepypasta draws people in as an eye widening piece of internet horror and the spin off stories keep people coming back for more. Moving on to number 8 now we have Tiki Toby. This is a famous creepypasta that a lot of you guys recommended. The story revolves around a boy called Toby who suffered from mental disorders as a child. It talks of him being bullied and also being homeschooled. He was abused by his father and when he turned 17 his sister was killed in a car crash. This sent him over the edge mentally and one night returning from hospital Toby saw the Slender Man, a man who needs no introduction. Slender Man stalked Toby for weeks causing many visual and auditory hallucinations. His mother brought him to a psychiatrist but to no avail. He dreamed of his sister's corpse followed by an attack by the Slender Man. The voice in his head told him to kill his father and one day those voices got the upper hand. Toby he stabbed his father in front of his mother. In a desperate attempt to escape the police, he set the whole neighborhood on fire but was soon surrounded by the flames. Just before he was consumed, Slender Man appeared in front of him and saved him. Two weeks later, Toby's mother heard that her son was the main suspect in the murder of several teenagers. From this day on, Toby was a proxy of Slender Man. Moving on to number 7 now, we have Ben Drowned. This was another creepypasta that many of you guys said I should have included in the first part. I went and found it and wow, it's a long one. Essentially, it's a story written by Alex Hall who's also known as Jadusable. It revolves around an old Majora's mascot cartridge that is haunted by the spirit of a boy named Ben. In life he was sacrificed by the Moon Children cult. His father was the one to drown him. The cartridge with his spirit in was passed from person to person until landing in the hands of the storyteller. He says that the game glitched in weird places, characters spoke strangely and the music sometimes played backwards. The story goes on to explain the influence of the cult, what really happened to Ben and maybe why you shouldn't trust the storyteller at all. Next up at number 6 now we have Clockwork. Her real name was Natalie Ouellette. She was once a normal girl, nothing out of the ordinary, either good or bad. However, when she was young, very young, the story was that Natalie was abused by her own family. The abuse mainly came in verbal and physical forms, although the details are quite hazy. During it all, Natalie is unable to tell anyone of the pain that she is going through. Eventually, she comes to believe that time itself, the very concept of time is somehow against her and not only that, that time led to her abuse. The story follows her through her tortured childhood, her battle against time and the disturbing loss of her sanity. Moving on to number 5 now we have Sally. That's the name of the story and also of the main character. A 12 year old girl who had been sexually abused by her own uncle and threatened into silence. Eventually she caved in and told her parents something was wrong. They just dismissed it as a nightmare though and sent her away. Sally was left with her mouth still hanging hanging open, the words of her abuse not able to reach her lips. She wasn't able to go into the details of the horrors her uncle inflicted upon her. Even worse though, her uncle heard her trying to tell her parents what happened and decided to take revenge. He tricked Sally's parents into letting him take her to the store, despite Sally not wanting to. Instead, he drove her to a park and killed her by smashing it in the side of her head with a rock after beating her up. The creepypasta details her story in much more gory, drawn out detail and even goes on to explain how Sally now haunts her old house, terrifying adults in the neighborhood while playing with the children there in peace, at least for now. Coming in at number 4 now we have the bloody painter. His real name was Helen Otis. One day at school, Helen decided to not help a girl named Judy who had lost her watch. A boy called Ben pointed out something in Helen's bag. Ben took it out and saw that it was the watch. Judy flipped out, blaming Helen that he stole the watch. Helen tried to tell her that he didn't do it but no one believed him. One day, Ben came back and this time he took his notebook and tore up 
his drawings. That upset Helen. He couldn't hold it anymore and so he punched him. In return, Helen was beaten badly. A few months later, he got a Facebook message from a stranger. It was a boy called Tom who had also been bullied. The pair bonded over this. A couple of days later, Tom asked Helen to meet him on the school rooftop. Helen agreed and went to the school rooftop the next day. When he got there, Tom told him that he framed Helen with Judy's watch. They both fought and Tom fell off the roof. Helen tried to save him but he didn't have the strength to save him. This made his bullying worse because people said that he killed Tom or at least didn't save him. Later that night, Helen lost it. He believed that Tom deserved to die and believed that others deserved to die as well. He killed everyone who bullied him under the name The Bloody Painter. Next up at number 3 now we have Anora Petrova. This is a scary creepy pasta that fits well into our modern age. It's the story of a woman who was on track to become a promising figure skater in the US. Everything was going great until she discovered an evil sentient Wikipedia page about her own life. It somehow detailed her death and the deaths of her family. It drove her to insanity. Anora tried to edit the page. She tried desperately to change her own fate, but her life spiraled out of control in the most horrific ways. The harrowing tale is told from the point of view of Anora as she continues on the descent into madness. Perhaps the creepiest part of the whole thing is that the Wikipedia page stops talking about her fairly on and instead starts addressing the reader. That's you. It instills a fear in people that it could happen to anyone, and it's a reminder that with the growth of the internet in this new age, of information, there are many corners for evil to hide. Next up now guys, at the number 2 spot we have Judge Angel. Originally she was called Diana. Ever since she was born, her father never loved her. She looked nothing like her parents and all her family ever seemed to notice were her eyes. Those deep black, soulless eyes. Eventually her father even left the household, unable to be around her. When she was 15, Diana was beaten by her father for wanting to go outside. Diana was not allowed to. When her mother tried to comfort her, her father turned on her too. One night Diana and her mother decided to run away on Christmas Eve that year. When the mother told the father this plan, he flew into a rage and beat her to death. Diana then picked up a sword from her father's study. After a final confrontation, she slew him on the spot pronouncing him guilty. She burned the house. She was seen by witnesses for the last time standing outside of the burning home and people swore she had wings. And finally number one now we have Nurse Anne. This story tells of Anne Lucen Mia. She was once a normal hard working nurse who unfortunately could never seem to get things right. Try as she might there were always terrible mistakes when treating her patients. One day though a serial killer caught her at work. When she entered the room the killer jumped her and started cutting her up into pieces. One of the other nurses found her dead. They took her to a specialist hospital and unbelievably they were able to stitch nurse Anne back together again. A disembodied voice helped her track down her killer and enact her revenge upon him. After she started killing though, she just couldn't stop. As time went by, her killing only increased. In the end, other creepypasta characters took an interest in her. To see her involvement with the other characters and the full extent of the grisly deeds, you'll have to read the full story of nurse Anne. <laughs>